Hello and welcome. Uh, I am Dr. Adnan Aslan uh, at Respect Graduate School. My guest today is Dr. Muhammad Fadl. Welcome, Muhammad Fadl. Thank you very much. So we are going to talk about the relationship between modern society and Islamic law. So before that, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Muhammad Fadl. Uh, professor Fadl is a full professor of faculty of law in University of Toronto, and Professor Fadl wrote his PhD dissertation on legal process in medieval Islamic law while at the University of Chicago, and also he received his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. Professor Fadl was admitted to the Bar of the New York in 2000. Professor Fadl has published numerous articles in Islamic legal history and Islamic liberalism. So, my first question is about how can you establish the relevance of Islamic law in the modern society? Huh. You should start with the easy questions. <laughs> so, th th this is a, <laughs> this is an easy question. Oh. <laughs> well, I think, you know, people have two different approaches to this question. Yes. And I think both of them are mistaken. The first is to say it doesn't matter whether Islamic law is relevant to the modern world or not. We as Muslims are commanded to follow Islam and so we should just follow whatever the rules of Islamic law are no matter what the modern law is, modern world is like. The yes. second answer is to say Islamic law um, is not relevant to the modern world so we should forget about it. Right? Okay. My work tries to take a moderate approach. Yes. In which I say, no, Islamic law is relevant to the modern world because we as Muslims have to live our lives um, according to the moral principles of Islam. Yes. But we have to adjust those moral principles in light of our circumstances in the modern world that are different from the circumstances that existed even just 200 years ago. Right? Yes. And so it calls on Muslims. Our condition as modern Muslims calls on us to take the moral principles of Islam and understand how to apply them in the world that we live in. Yes. So I try to take a middle position yes. between these two extremes. I see. How do you justify your position in terms of, let me say, uh, uh, irrelevancy of the Islamic law uh, with regard to the implementation? Some people would say that. Yeah, well, I say that, that, again, I don't think you can continue to be a Muslim if you adopt that. Yes. Because Islam teaches us that how we treat other people yes. is just as much of a part of our religion as how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Right? There's a hadith, ad dinul mu'amala. Right? So how we interact with other people is just as important as how we act with, interact with our Creator. Yes. And in fact, I think we know from our theology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready to forgive us for our shortcomings with respect to him, yes. but he can't forgive us for what we do to other people. When I we see. wrong other people, um, they have rights that they will collect from us on the Day of Judgment. Yes. So we have to take very seriously this idea that we have to live in the modern world in a way that is fair to other people, in a way that we can account ourselves before our Creator. And so we have to think about how Islamic morality informs how we interact with other people. We, we can't avoid that. We can't be Muslims simply by praying and fasting yes. and giving yes. charity to poor people. That's, that's not enough. I see. I see. My second question, is Islamic state impossible? <laughs> um, it again depends on what you mean by an Islamic state and what you mean by Islamic law, right? So some people who say that Islamic state is impossible I think they have a very dogmatic view of what Islamic law is, and they have a very dogmatic view of what the modern state is. Um, again, I don't necessarily subscribe to those views because I think that Islamic law is flexible and can be adapted to whatever circumstances Muslims find themselves in based on um, you know, the, 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 moral, the general universal moral I principles see. of Islam in light of particular circumstances we find ourselves in. Likewise, I don't think the modern state 
is something that in and of itself is evil or immoral. So, you know, if you believe the modern state is evil and immoral, then the only thing you can do is go find a cave in the mountains yeah. and, and go live there. But I don't think that is what Islam calls on Muslims to do. You know, uh, yeah. Islam always tells us to make the best of what we can, of what we find ourselves in. So, you know, there's the hadith. I don't know if it's a say, say hadith, but I think it's something that most Muslims hear growing up that um, even if you know tomorrow's the day of judgment, yeah. still plant a tree today. Yes, yes. Right? And so a Muslim always has to have a positive attitude in life yes. and to try to do the best that she or he can given her circumstances. Yes. Within the context of the nation state, mm -hmm. Islamic law is incompatible with the principles of the nation state. Well, it depends what you understand the principles of the nation state are. There are certain ideas, like the idea that the nation state is of unlimited sovereignty yeah. and that all loyalty is due to the nation state. That, of course, is something that Muslims reject yes. because we believe that um, only, the only, only God is entitled to unqualified obedience. Right? Yes. Everybody else is only, is only obeyed to the extent that the commands are consistent with the law. Yeah. So the idea of an Islamic state is very important because Muslims have to live at peace with one another. This is a fundamental principle of Islamic Indeed. law. Indeed. And so when Muslims talk about an Islamic state, one of the, I mean, something that we don't understand is that you know, prior to you know, colonialism, yeah. There were lots of different Muslim states. That's and so true. people say, oh, the caliphate didn't exist. There were so many different Muslim rulers. But they don't understand that the idea of the caliphate is a legal idea. It's not a yes. personal idea. I see. Yeah. And so when Muslim states had conflicts with each other, which they did, it was always subject to rules. That's right? true. And so warfare was very limited, right? Mm -hmm. So. It, the violence that took place was much on a much smaller scale than the violence that took place, for example, in Europe in the 17th century and the rise of the nation state, because the nation state gave itself the right to, white, to wage unlimited war, right? Um, so the idea of an Islamic state is, is very important for the idea of, of a humanity that is at peace with itself, right? Yes. That violence is not a means of resolving disputes, because Muslims when they fight, it's called baghi. I see, right? yes. You know, and the Quran mm -hmm. says to, 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 to solve the dispute between your two brothers. If your brothers are fighting, then reconcile them, right? That's true. So um, the idea of an Islamic state is very, very important. And it's not inconsistent with the ideas of national self-determination. But what it's inconsistent with is the idea of the use of violence to pursue power, to pursue interests, yes. right? Um, and that um, we should kill each other for our political disputes. Yes. That's what Islam rejects. Yes. Right? So um, if you think that the modern nation state requires us to be willing to kill and be killed for the state, then yes, that that's, that's inconsistent with Islam. But you know, lots of people reject that idea, and they're not Muslims. Yeah. So why should Muslims accept an idea of the nation state that is so morally repugnant even to rational people, right? Yes. You know, the, often the people who say that the modern state is incompatible with Islam are giving a version of the state that, for lack of a better term, is a fascist idea, right? Yes. And so, yes, Muslims reject fascism. Of course we should reject fascism. But that doesn't mean that all states have to be fascistic. Yes. Uh, nation state uh, actually does not have the uh, ethical ethical objective. That is one of the criticism of the nation state. But on the other hand, Islamic state has to have the, the ethical objectives. Again, I think it depends on your perspective of what 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 counts as an ethical purpose. Um, yes. You know, so. Um, if we take a, a liberal state. So oftentimes yes. people make this criticism of liberal states that they have no ethical mission. Yes. So the liberal will say, well, the ethical content of liberalism is to protect freedom, is to protect freedom. Now, what I would say is that, well, in fact, in order to have a stable society that protects freedom, the citizens themselves have to have a lot of other moral values, right? Yes. 
in order to respect one another, in order not to commit violence against one another, in order to treat people fairly. These are all sort of virtues yes. that don't just come about naturally. People have to have a source of value. And I think what's sometimes misunderstood is a lot of the classical liberals assumed that the citizens have sources of moral values, like yes. religion, yes. and that that will persist. So even though the state itself doesn't have a particular religion, let's say in liberalism, um, the people do, right? Okay. And the people, because they have their own source of morality, they will respect one another and treat each other fairly and justly, etc. Um, now the problem is, is it really possible to sustain the morality of a community if the state itself doesn't promote it? This is, I see. This is where some of the criticisms of liberalism come about. So some people will say that it's impossible to sustain the morality of liberalism unless the state teaches people. Yes. Right? If the state is agnostic about everything, then the citizens end up being agnostic and nihilistic. Right? This is almost the result of the modern society, is so, it not? You know, some people, I think it's a serious question. Like, you know, what I like to say is um, liberals need to think about how is it that somebody like Donald Trump could be elected president of the United States, right? Yeah. That shows that there was a great moral vacuum in the United States. I see. The fact that somebody like Trump could win, given yeah. how, you know, let me just say immoral of a person he is, right? Yes. It's shocking that people would freely elect somebody like that. You know, uh, the fact that they freely elected somebody like that tells you that there's some sort of serious moral dilemma or moral di moral failing in that community. Yes. Right? You know, the Prophet Sallallahu said, "You get the leaders you deserve, more or less." That's yes, that's true. And so, if if the American people elect Donald Trump or find him popular, that tells you that there's a moral crisis in the community. And we need to ask, why is it that we have this moral crisis? Uh, perhaps it's because of liberalism, perhaps it's not. Perhaps it's because there's not enough liberalism, I I'm not sure. But it is a, it's, a, it's an important question, because I do think... What is your opinion? What is the cause of this moral uh, impoverishment? I think, I think there's a lot of issues, but I yes. think one is that um, you know, um, market capitalism has yes. gone out of control. So... Um, people are being taught to be consumers all the time. Yes. And being a consumer is very different than being a citizen. A consumer I is all about that. instant gratification. So the media is constantly sending out messages to the people about how to satisfy their immediate desires. What we yes. in Islam would say, ah al hawa, yeah. ahwa. Yes. Right? But to be just and to be fair, and to be a good ruler requires you to restrain your hawa That's true. and make and think about long-term decisions. Yes. So a democracy requires the people to act as citizens. Yes. And so a citizen has to be able to restrain himself, control himself, think about what's best for himself and others, right? Yes. But um, popular culture is constantly undermining our capacity to think about what's best for ourselves. It's just constantly encouraging us to pursue short-term gratification. Indeed, yeah. Right? And if that's all it's about, then you get somebody like Trump, who's an entertainer, who's very good at manipulating people's passion. Yes. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, my, another question is, uh, how can you justify inequalities regarding men and women, believers and non-believers, in Islamic law? <laughs> Um, well, I'm not sure how much I justify them or, or not justify them. So, do you think it is a there are some there are some there are some inequalities that are expressly in the Quran, yes, um, and some that aren't, yes. right? And we have to explore each one on its own, right? Um, so, let us take inheritance, right? Well, historically speaking. Right? Um, Muslim women were exempt from lots of the obligations, uh, fi particularly financial obligations, that uh, bound men. Right? So it's kind of easy to understand uh, why men, and it's not all men, it's only some men, get more 
in terms of inheritance than a similarly situated woman. Um, so a son gets twice as much, a, a brother gets twice as much as his sister, right? Um, but sisters and brothers share equally. It's yes. interesting. So it's not, a, it's not always the case. But um, again, I don't know about other madhabs, but in the Maliki madhab, for example, um, men are always required to make financial contributions. For example, when, you know, if my brother, you know, um, runs over somebody with a car and kills that person, then in Islamic law, not only my brother has to pay for it, but the whole, all, the, yeah. all the male kin yes. have to help him. Yes. But the women are exempt. Oh, I see. The women are exempt from that obligation, only I the see. men, right? I see. Uh, you know, the husband is obliged to spend on the wife, but not the other way around. You know, in the Hanafi madhab, the, 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 the father is always responsible for his, his, his daughter. So if the daughter gets divorced, she goes back to the, the father, and the father is responsible for her. If, you know, if my sister gets divorced, I have to take care of her in the Hanafi system. So men generally have much bigger financial contributions, responsibility uh, than women do. Um, so my colleague uh, Aziz al Hibri, who's a, a law professor, a retired law professor, she's Lebanese, she pointed out that in inheritance, women get their share net, mm -hmm. while men get their share gross. I see. Yeah. Because men are subject to all these claims, whereas the women have no claims against them. Um, but we have to remember that you know the heirs are perfectly free to split the property the way they want to. Yes. Right? It's, yes. Not, a, it's not a sin. Yes. So, you know, if the brother and sister grow up in the United States and they think it's very important or fair for it to be equal, fine. They can do it. They, yes. Right? And then in Islamic law also, um, you can have what's known as inter vivos gifts. Yes. So I can give gifts to my children as long as I'm alive. Yes. And when I do so, I'm supposed to do it equally. Yes. Right? So I'm supposed to give my daughters the same amount as I give my sons, right? Yes. So there's not, it's, not a, it's not a principle of inequality for the sake of inequality, right? Um, it just happens to be that in this case when the person dies, then at that point in time it's distributed in that way. Um, as I said, against a background where women didn't really have the same financial obligations as men did, right? And, you know, there's no prohibition against treating them e equally during your lifetime. In fact, it's, it's recommended. So uh, another example, um, in Islamic law, we have this institution known as the waqf, or a trust. Yeah. And so Muslims used to oftentimes distribute the bulk of their estate in the waqf. So yeah. before they died, they would set up an endowment, a waqf, and having specific instructions about how the property would be distributed. And so uh, Imam Malik عنه, was asked about a waqf in which the person who made it limited it only to his sons. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's haram. I see. Because if you make a waqf only for your sons, that's like what they did in Jahiliyyah. I see. But if you make a waqf only for your daughters, that's okay. Oh, right? I see, yes. So, you know, you can say that Islam sort of introduced rules as a kind of affirmative action for yeah. women. Because women didn't get anything, and it gave them this. And it doesn't object to giving them more, right? Okay. What it rejects is giving them less. Right? I see that. However, in Islamic law, there is no notion of citizenship, equal citizenship. Am I right? Um, well, it's sort of hard to talk about that because citizenship in many ways is a modern idea. So it's kind of anachronistic to talk about equal citizenship. So what do we mean by equal citizenship? Do we mean... For instance, believer and non-believer. Yes. And is not the equal. Or ehl uh, zimma. Yes. Is not equal. Again, these are very complicated ideas. Right? Yes. So I will you know, talk about the Hanafis. Okay. Because the Hanafis, I think, have the, the closest position to equality in the pre-modern world. Right? So the Hanafis, unlike the other madhabs, right, said that um, Muslims and non-Muslim, dhimmis, are treated exactly the same, their life and their property. So if a Muslim kills an, a non-Muslim dhimmi, the non-Muslim the non dhimmi 
next of kin can have the Muslim put to death, right? If it's an accidental homicide, the dhimmi gets the same compensation as a Muslim, right? Only in a Hanafi school? Only in the Hanafi school, right? Why do they say that? Yes. It's important to understand the reasoning. Because I think the reasoning that they give gives us a way of understanding equality in the modern world. They said that human beings consist of sort of, there are two aspects to the human being. Okay. One is spiritual. Yes. And one is, is material. Okay. The spiritual aspect is reflected in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Right? And in that dimension, we're not equal. Of course. Because some of us are prophets, some of us are saints, some of us are sinners, etc. But that's for the next life. Not this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge us on that dimension in the next life. Our true humanity is in that dimension. But fiqh protects our existence as bodies, as things. I see. Our thingness, our thinginess, is derivative of our true humanity. Our true humanities are spiritual. But our body is also real, but it's secondary, right? But insofar as we're all human bodies, we're equal. Yes. We're all weak. We're all, you know, we all bleed if we're cut. Yes. We all need food to eat. Yes. Uh, we all need to have families to reproduce. Yes. This relates to our existence as bodies, as physical things. And so the law needs to protect us equally as physical things, right? Yes. And so they called this, right? This is the, that's the dimension where law really operates. So law protects us in our capacity as physical objects, not as spiritual beings, right? Yes. So from that perspective, we're all equal, right? So I think when we think about that division, which you can think about the division between the spiritual and the political. Yes, I you like can, that. You can That's justify very, the very idea good. of political equality among all people despite their religious beliefs. Because everybody has an interest in having security I in see. this life. Right? Yes. So, um, so I don't think, again, that there's a kind of obligation to treat non-Muslims as unequal under Islamic law. It's just that you know, citizenship wasn't the prevailing ideal. Um, and, you know, again, the assumption, particularly when these rules were created, yes. Muslims were a very small minority. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, it was only over time that most people had converted to Islam. So, you know, in societies where 90% of the people are Muslims, what's, what harm is there? Yes. in giving non-Muslims equal political rights as Muslims. They're not going to threaten Muslims with it. Yes, you are talking about the historically yes. that was the case. But let us imagine in the future, so there is an Islamic state. Yeah. So there, there wouldn't be any kind of equal citizenship, is it? Well, I'm, that's what I'm saying. There should be. Should be, I yeah, see. Yeah, based on Hanafi rules. And I'm saying change circumstances, right? Yes. I mean, why should I, why, do, why would I think that Abu Hanifa and Malik, etc., would have the same view in a society where 95% of people are Muslim as opposed to a society where only 5% are Muslims. I see, yes. Right? Yes. So, yeah, they said non-Muslims can't testify against Muslims. But that was in a time when 95% were non-Muslims. I see. Yeah, right? I see, yeah. Right? So, um, times change. Yeah. And... Um, you know, we can have a different we can have a different view of things. Okay, so this question is related with the when the time changes, whether the the rules would change. Do you believe that the punishments proclaimed in the Quran, hudud, <laughs> should be implemented? You're really getting at sensitive points. Yes, this is most uh, I find very well versed, professor in the Islamic law, these are the great questions. People well, thinking about that. So you know, again, I need to I ask think, this. I think this is one of these issues that have a lot of symbolic value to Muslims, okay. but aren't practically very important. And the reason for that is if you accept what the fuqaha say, yes. the rules that the fuqaha developed were kind of intended to make sure that these penalties are never applied. 
So I know we spend a lot the of penalties should be there, but never applied. Yes, Are I mean that was that? basically the position of the fuqaha. Uh, I see. Right? Now the problem is that a lot of contemporary Muslims sort of feel that Islam isn't being applied unless we do this, right? Okay. So there's a kind of, for lack of a better term, fetishism okay. about the hudud. That the only way you can prove commitment to Islam is if you chop hands off or if you stone adulterers. If you don't do that, you're not really Muslim, right? Among, in, in the views of certain people. Um, but I think, actually, if we were really serious about thinking about what an Islamic state would look like in the modern period, we have to be much more concerned about other crimes. So the, the jurists talked about two kinds of crimes, the hudud, which are you know, the ones you're asking me yeah. about. Um, and, I, and, and as I said, those are more theoretical problems than actual problems because the rules of the fiqh make it almost impossible to apply them. But there's a whole other set of crimes, like everything else. Those are called ta'zir, discretionary penalties. Now those are too easy to apply. Mm. I see. And the reason for that was, again, because in the pre-modern world, the state was very weak. Yes. Very weak. And so long... Is it positive or negative? In what, in what way? The, the state is the weak because the, the citizen or the people or subject were, the, were, were the more free... Uh, well, uh, it depends how you look at it. You yeah. know, they're more free to be attacked by criminals. No, no. I, in a sense, to the <laughs> to the to the power of the state is is very much you know. Uh, okay. Exercising. Yes. The, the let me let me tell you. It depends how you understand things. Okay. Right? So here I'm going to do a little bit of political theory. Yeah. There are two conceptions of freedom. There's negative freedom and positive freedom. Yes. Negative freedom is when nobody can interfere with what you want to do. Yes. Right. Um, positive freedom is when you have the ability to achieve what you want to achieve. Yes. Okay. Now, both are valuable, but liberalism tends to, pre to, to prioritize negative freedom. But negative freedom isn't very valuable if you don't have the resources to take advantage of yes. it. Right? So the freedom of education is meaningless to me if education costs $100,000 a year and I don't have $100,000. Oh, right? yes. And um, we could say that... Um, Equality is not, if you have a rule that prohibits everybody from sleeping under bridges at night, well, that's equal, but you know, only the poor people want to sleep under bridges at night. <laughs> so um, you need to have both positive freedom and negative freedom, right? Yes. Positive freedom establishes the conditions for you to exercise your freedom. Okay. Now, the problem with a weak state is that the powerful, the powerful can exercise their power over other people. I see, yes. So if you live in a country like Egypt, where the law is very weak, right? The rich can do whatever they want. Uh, I see. And you can't stop them because you can't take them to court. I the see court is point. very weak. Yes. So, you know, if you, you're Turkish. Yes. So you've been to Top Kapi. Yeah. Right? You know, when you go into Top Kapi, you know what it says? Yes. As Sultan Dhillullahi fil Ard. But we only say the first half of it. It also says, Yet we ilayhi. The Sultan is the, is the shadow of God on earth. Why? Because every weak party seeks refuge in it. Yes, that's good. Yes. So the, the idea of the state in Islam, as I understand it, is to protect the rights of the weak against the strong. Okay. So in Islamic law, the positive freedom of people are, is just as important as the negative freedom. Negative freedom is important, but you have to secure people against the violence of the rich and powerful. Yes. So when you have a weak state, it's the law of the jungle. Yes. Right? This is the problem. So in the Middle Ages, because states were very weak, jurists were more concerned about the abuses of the powerful than they were of the abuses of the king. Because the king generally was weak. The ruler was weak, generally speaking. Right? I see. Um, so they, they really weren't, they didn't think enough about protecting the rights of criminal defendants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so this is what I'm saying, that the problem in the Islamic criminal law is not hudud so much, because they're very, very, very conscious of protecting people from being convicted for, for hudud. But with respect to other penalties, it's pretty easy to convict people. 
And so that can be used in a very arbitrary and capricious way in the modern period. Like so in Saudi Arabia, when they sentence somebody to 50 years for a tweet, they're using ta'zir. I see. So the real threat is ta'zir, not hudud. But hudud should be there as a threat. Do you, do, you, do you think so? Well, I mean, I don't know how much of a threat it is when people know that they can't be punished by it. But the acts themselves yes. communicate to people that these are really serious sins, Yes. right? So it serves an educational function, right? So even though people know that they can't be stoned for committing adultery or have their hands cut off for theft, the very fact that God says that in the Quran yes. tells them this is a really serious sin, so That's don't true. do it. Yes. So it serves an important sort of moral lesson, right? Yes. Even if they know it's not going to happen to them. Yes, but how about the uh, conflict with the human rights? This is obviously... I yes, mean. it's a serious issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've said is that... Um, you know, in, according to Malik at least, I mean, the Hanafis have a different view, um, the main purpose for hudud is penance, not punishment. Okay. So, you know, what is the difference, penance? And penance is to make yourself right with God. I Tauba. See. Tauba. I see, I see, yes. So the idea behind having the had penalty applied to you is that it's a way of committing, re of repenting to God for your sin. And so for that reason, um, Malik didn't s subject non-Muslims to hudud because since they don't believe in Islam, they don't get the benefit of it, right? Yes. Um, so, you know, for, if we're really interested in a philosophical argument, we could say, well, hudud aren't really criminal law because criminal law is supposed to be about secular things. Hudud is about penitence. Yes. So it should be, you know, we could say that if somebody insists on having the had applied to that person in order to repent, that that could be consistent with that person's own religious freedom, right? But I think this is a, it's more of a theoretical question than a practical one. Again, I don't, I don't imagine lots of people volunteering to have hudud penalties placed on them. I see. Okay, uh, Professor Fadl, thank you very much. You're very welcome. It was great to talk to you. I really appreciate uh, your, uh, your answers. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay. Let us talk.